light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh as always i'm joined by my brother and producer joel and today we are diving into the very disturbing case of a man named nico jenkins but before we get into nico's story i wanted to remind you all about a few things first of all the lights out youtube channel is only 10,000 subscribers away from 300,000, which is truly remarkable that we've had this much growth in the last year or so i think we're going on two years now of the show and it's just crazy that we're very very close to that 300,000 mark and i'd love nothing more <laughs> than to hit 300,000 subscribers by the end of the year that's a tall order but there are 30 percent of you that are not subscribed to the show that do watch the show on youtube or maybe you're an audio listener and that's where you usually enjoy the podcast i'd love if you just popped over to youtube the lights out youtube channel and made sure you subscribe to us there it does really help us out as well as making sure you're subscribed on apple podcasts and following us on spotify all those different avenues really do help out our numbers and just overall performance of the show which just helps us get the show out to many more people and also what's really cool is that you can now watch lights out on spotify in video form which is really cool and exciting we we're lucky to sort of get invited into this new program that Spotify is starting to roll out. You've probably maybe seen Joe Rogan podcast or Joe Rogan experience on Spotify, and that's where he's exclusively at. We're not exclusive with Spotify, so it's still always going to be everywhere else and on YouTube, but you can now actually enjoy the video version of the show right on Spotify yep. for free, which is really cool. Yeah. So if you want to check that out, we only have up to date one episode on that, which was our last one, Andre. Uh, Chikatilo. <laughs> Chikatilo, yeah. Chikatilo. So yep. check that episode out if you haven't already. Yep. From here on out, we'll be uploading a video version of the show to Spotify as well. So just more places to enjoy Lights Out. Also, we have gone ahead and restocked the Candle Skull design, which is basically our logo, our new logo now. And we restocked the Candle Skull T, the long sleeve, as well as the Mineral Wash Skull hoodie, which is really cool, really popular. So that is available in all sizes right now. So if you you know, missed out on that when it sold out, it is now available for pre-order. And you can check that out at milehiremerch.com slash lights dash out. And that is our merch store. But with all that out of the way, this episode of the Lights Out Podcast is brought to you by honeystamps.com and every plate. Let's dive into the very dark world of Nico Jenkins. So Nico Allen Jenkins was born September 16th 1986 in denver colorado and it's kind of creepy because my birthday is september 17th so it's only a day prior oh i know and he was born right here in denver which is where you know we live and where we're from i wasn't actually born here but it's still frightening to know that he was born a day earlier than me and he is a virgo just like myself <laughs> which kind of explains a lot honestly but his parents were david mcgee and Lori jenkins and his father wasn't around much and his mother raised him mostly by herself but she wasn't the best influence on Nico, and his home life was rough for most of his childhood. His immediate and distant family members were a group of felons and hell raisers that had been in trouble with police for generations. Violent crime, alcohol abuse, and child neglect are the only a few of the scandals in his family's past. Nearly 20 children have been removed from his relatives' homes. And during his life, supposedly 150 crimes were committed by his family alone that ended in acquittals, mistrials, or dropped charges. And they've been convicted of a total of 633 crimes since 1979. I mean, you don't hear that every day, a total like crime family. And it was all these family members that Nico and his siblings were surrounded by throughout his childhood. And by the early age of seven years old, Nico became just another family member added to the criminal justice system when he brought a 25 caliber handgun to school. And he later said that a voice in his head told him to do it. A year later, his mother took Nico to the hospital claiming he had been talking about self-harm. And they admitted him and he spent 11 days there. Dr. Jane Dolkey diagnosed him with oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD. When he was 11, he moved into a group home in Papillion, Nebraska. And this was also the time he supposedly stopped attending school. He didn't get along with anyone in the group home and always got into fights. And on February 26, 1998, he whipped another kid with a wire clothes hanger 
that left welts across his body. He also admitted to stealing on three separate occasions. So they moved him out of the group home and into a youth detention center. Later that year, he was released on probation and went to live with his mother. But soon after being released, he was arrested by police again after assaulting someone with a knife. And after causing so much trouble while back on the streets, the justice system revoked his probation in August 2001, and they sent him to a youth rehab and treatment center. A year later, he was released from the rehab center and he went to live with his family in Omaha, Nebraska. But despite his rehab, his violence continued. According to his father, David, Nico once pulled out a sawed-off shotgun in his family's kitchen. He pointed the gun at his dad and threatened to kill him. And his rage and violence continued throughout his teenage years. But he stayed off of the police's radar for a bit. But in 2003, when he was just 17 years old, he decided to steal two cars. The first, he stopped a man in his black Honda Civic, pointed a shotgun at him and forced him out of the car, and then took off with it. The second, he spotted a 20-year-old woman driving a 1983 Cadillac DeVille, and he walked up to the driver's window and asked if she would take him for a ride. And when she refused, he jumped into the back of the car and again pulled out his shotgun. He aimed it at her head and told her to drive him around. When they reached 22nd Street and Grand Avenue, he ordered her out of the car, hopped in the driver's seat, and then took off with it. Police caught him soon after and sent him to prison for two armed carjackings but the violence didn't stop there. While incarcerated in Douglas County Correctional Center, he constantly talked to the other inmates about how he couldn't wait to get a gun and shoot people. He also carved shivs out of plastic toilet brushes to use as weapons. He constantly started fights with correctional officers and other inmates, and at one point he joined in a prison riot. And because of his behavior, he was constantly in and out of solitary confinement. And over the years, he became infamous and he also gathered a large following of female admirers from the outside. Officers even called them the Colt of Nico. The women always sent him letters and came to visit him and even called themselves his wives as they were drawn to his violent behavior. One of his admirers, Sherry Floyd, saw him at his grandmother's funeral for the first time. In 2009, Nico's grandmother had died and they allowed him to attend the funeral, but only under the supervision of prison guards. While he was there, Nico assaulted one of the guards, causing a scene, and Sherry was completely terrified of Nico after that. But that's what she found attractive about him. After they dragged him back to prison, a county judge sentenced him to two to four years for the assault, but it was later cut to one to two years under state sentencing guidelines. Also, the judge ordered his sentences to be served concurrently, meaning that it wasn't added to the end of his current sentence for the carjackings. After his constant violent outbursts, the system finally became suspicious that Nico might be mentally ill. So Douglas County District Judge Gary Randall ordered an evaluation by a Lincoln Regional Center psychiatrist. And on July 20th, 2010, Dr. Scott Moore met with Nico in prison and examined him. Nico told the doctor that his problems stemmed from the abuse he suffered by family members as a child. He even added that he heard voices from the Egyptian god Apophis. In Egyptian mythology, this god was known as the Great Serpent, who tried to destroy the sun god and return the world to chaos. He was associated with earthquakes, thunder, darkness, storms, and death. The god was often depicted as a coiled serpent or a snake, and was often dismembered, cut into pieces, or under attack. And Nico claimed the voice of Apophis was the same voice that told him to bring a gun to school when he was seven. But that wasn't all. Dr. Moore also reported that Nico told him he wanted to eat human brains. He thought if he ate a pituitary gland, it would make him stronger and wiser. And despite the insane things Nico said during the evaluation, Dr. Moore thought he was just faking it to get out of prison early. And as a result, he became more infamous from the crazy things he said. In 2010, he married a woman named Chalanda while still in prison as she found him fascinating and they spent most of their marriage behind bars. But Nico ended up getting out of prison early, since the judge had ordered his sentences to be served concurrently. And only a few years after his marriage, in July 2013, at 27 years old, Nico was back on the streets. By the time he left prison, he had tattooed his face and neck with illegible words. He shaved his head, 
and after exercising almost every day, he had built up plenty of muscle. He didn't look anything like the skinny kid that got locked up at 17. When he got out of the prison, the first thing that he did was attend a release party at the Omaha Travel Lodge at 71st and Grover Streets. Most of the people at the party were women from the cult of Nico. One of them was a 48-year-old Sherry Floyd, the woman who fell in love with Nico after his grandmother's funeral. She had visited Nico in prison several times and even tattooed her own face because he wanted her to. And at the party, she claimed to see Nico and his 31-year-old cousin, Anthony Wells, go into a private room. Anthony pulled a pistol grip shotgun out of a black bag and gave it to Nico as a gift. And later, Nico told Sherry that he wanted to go to Cuba to become an MMA fighter or join the Cuban military so he could fight against the U.S. He held a grudge against the justice system after serving 10 years behind bars. And later in the evening, Sherry and Nico went into one of the hotel rooms at the Travel Lodge and took a shower together. According to Nico's mother, Lori, this led to a screaming match between Sherry and Nico's then-wife, Chalanda Jenkins. During the argument, Sherry reached for the bag that had the shotgun in it and pulled it out and aimed it at Nico's wife. She threatened to kill her, but after a brief argument, they eventually calmed down. Nico was upset with Sherry, so he told her to leave immediately. After the party, Sherry said she feared for her life and thought Nico or Chalanda would come after her. She became paranoid that he was following her. And not long after the party, Nico's mother was caught on camera buying deer slug ammunition for Nico's new 12-gauge shotgun. And only two weeks after getting out of prison, Nico decided to use it. In August of 2013, Nico's 23-year-old sister, Erica Jenkins, and a friend, Christine Bordeaux, flagged down two men in a white Ford pickup truck. The two men in the pickup truck were Juan Uriba Pena, who is 26, and Jorge Cahiga Ruiz, who is age 29. While Erica and Christine pretended to be prostitutes, they lured the men to a parking lot near a swimming pool in Spring Lake Park. They promised to have sex with them once they got there, but the men knew they'd been tricked when Nico approached the car with his shotgun. He held them both at gunpoint, and he cocked the gun and quickly aimed the gun at Juan's head. The man looked at Nico with fear in his eyes, but before he could say anything, Nico pulled the trigger. Blood, brains, and skull fragments flew all over the car and the deer slug drilled a massive hole straight through his head. Erica and Christine screamed as the body slumped forward. They thought it was only supposed to be a robbery. Then Nico turned the gun on Jorge, and just before Nico pulled the trigger, Jorge put his hands in front of his face. That's when the gun went off, and the deer slug went straight through his hands, into his brain, and out the back of his skull. Nico quickly turned out their pockets and took all the money he could find. When he told his mother about the murders, the only thing that she asked was if he got any money out of it, so he showed her the cash. At 5 a.m. on August 11th, the police found the two bodies in the car. Blood coated the interior and soaked into the seats, and the victims' heads were scattered throughout the vehicle. And only eight days after this, Nico was ready to kill again. His next target was 22-year-old Curtis Bradford, a man that Nico had met in prison. Curtis's family had told him to stay away from Nico, but they had become good friends while incarcerated. Nico even described Curtis as my little homie. Nico called him up one day and asked if he wanted to hang out. And they even took a picture together and posted it on Facebook. Then Nico asked if he wanted to do a home robbery with him. Or in Nico's words, do a lick. Curtis agreed and the next day he went over to 18th and Clark Streets where he waited for Nico. Eventually Nico and his sister Erica showed up. But Erica was convinced that Curtis was the one who shot up their house not long before and she wanted revenge. She held the pistol grip shotgun that Nico used the week before, and with no hesitation, she aimed the shotgun at Curtis and pulled the trigger. Supposedly, after Curtis fell to the ground, Nico grabbed the shotgun from Erica and told her that she didn't do it right. He then walked over to Curtis's body, aimed the shotgun at his head, and shot him once more, execution style. At 7 a.m. on August 19th, a man was on his way home from working the night shift at a convenience store when he spotted something on the ground by a detached garage. And when he got closer, he noticed that it was a body with a giant hole in the head. So he quickly called the police. In only eight days, Nico had racked up three victims, and he had no intention of stopping, because his next victim would be Andrea Kruger, 
a mother of three. Andrea was driving home from her job at the bar to take care of her sick child. And that night, Nico was out with three of his relatives, including his uncle, Warren Levering. And apparently that night, they were looking for an SUV to stroll around town and, and rob people in order to get money for Lil Wayne tickets. And that's when they saw Andrea driving down the street in her Chevy Traverse SUV. And that's when they pulled in front of her at a stop sign at 168th and Fort Streets, blocking her way. They jumped towards the car and Nico ripped open the driver's side door and dragged Andrea to the pavement. With a shotgun in hand, he aimed it at her as she struggled to get up. He then proceeded to shoot her four times while she was still on the ground screaming. He then shot her in the neck, back, and head until she was almost unrecognizable. They then hopped into the SUV and drove it around for two and a half hours before abandoning it. Nico didn't take any cash in Andrea's purse and they abandoned the car not long after the shooting. Police found Andrea's body on August 21st lying in the middle of the street. And after the slaying of Andrea, police needed to act fast to catch the killer, as they understood they now had a spree killer on the loose. The main difference between a serial killer and a spree killer is that a spree killer doesn't stop between murders. They quickly move on to the next one without thinking. The victims of a spree killer are also random and spread out. And Nico's victims crossed racial, gender, and city boundaries, which was rare. But luckily for police, Nico was sloppy and left trails everywhere. Police quickly caught a lead when checking surveillance footage. Police were able to go back to the bar where Andrea worked and check the footage, and they saw her leave at 1.47 a.m. on the night of her murder. They then checked the local traffic surveillance and saw her SUV, and they tracked it down by 6.30 that evening. When they found the abandoned SUV, it looked like someone had tried to start a fire inside, but failed. The upholstery was slightly burned, and there was a smell of smoke inside. On August 30th, Sherry Floyd, the woman that had threatened Nico's wife with the shotgun, had become paranoid and convinced that Nico was out to get her. He had called her and threatened to kill her and her family, saying he was going to send demonic forces to her house. She had heard about his murders and thought she was being followed, so she called the police and told them she feared for her life. Luckily, police were able to track Nico down to a relative's house and arrested him. But they didn't arrest him for the murders. They arrested him for making terroristic threats in letters he had sent to the judges. Unrelated to the murders or the carjacking, Nico had previously sent letters to two judges that were involved in his previous criminal cases. He held a grudge against them and sent them erratic letters before leaving prison. On July 14th, he had written a letter to Douglas County District Judge Gary Randall who sentenced him for assaulting the prison guard back in 2009. Most of the letter was hard to read, but it sounded like a threat. He wrote, Goddess Queens, I leave you wealth and royalty in my intellect's brilliance. The kingdom's power I protect with nature of animalistic savage brutality. He wrote the letter in the shape of a diamond and also attached a picture of a tattoo on his forehead. And during the same month before he was released, he wrote another letter to District Judge Shelley Stratman who had prosecuted him during the 2009 assault trial. He wrote some of the sentences in the shape of a circle. Most of the letter was incomprehensible, but some parts of it worried the police. Nico called himself a lethal warrior and ended the letter saying he would see the judge very soon. After this, they kept their tabs on Nico, but didn't watch close enough. After his spree, he was locked up and denied bail. His uncle Warren Levering was also arrested for the murder of Andrea Kruger. Anthony Wells, Nico's cousin that was seen giving him the shotgun, was also arrested, and they caught his mother Lori on camera buying the deer slugs, so they arrested her too. Nico's sister Melanie Jenkins and acquaintance Christine Bordeaux were also taken into custody. Authorities also questioned Jenkins' wife, Chalanda Jenkins. His sister Erica was arrested on criminal mischief warrant, and two counts of assault on a confined person while in jail. And during her arraignment, she began yelling at the judge when she gave her a bail of $350,000. The judge asked her if she wanted a muzzle, and she responded, Do you want a fucking muzzle? As the officers went to escort her out of the courtroom while handcuffed, she flipped over the wooden podium in front of her, and they dragged her out of the courtroom and threw her back in her jail cell. But by now, police had arrested almost the entire family. While all of them were in custody, police got a search warrant for Nico's apartment near 108th and Maple Streets. 
They linked the murders to Nico after they found the shotgun and the deer slug ammo he used to kill three of the four victims. And only a few days after being in jail, Nico broke down and said he was ready to talk to police. On September 3rd, 2013, he contacted police and said it was going to be a very long night, but that he was ready to tell them everything. But he didn't want to talk to them in the jailhouse because he had too many family members there. If they knew he was talking to police, his family might have killed him. So they took him to the police station and offered him food and drinks before the interview. He ordered a coffee, water, two double cheeseburgers, a chicken sandwich, fries, and milk from McDonald's. And over the next several hours, he told the police officers everything. But it wasn't exactly what they expected. Officers cycled in and out of the interrogation room for hours during his rambling interview. And the first thing he told them was that he was bipolar and schizophrenic. And he wasn't taking his medication. I think it's best that I just show you some clips and allow you to listen to some of the interrogation footage. I'll play that now. And I'm going to give you from A to Z. This is not no goose chase. This is the real deal right here. Which, okay, which you people go. signed up for. I never knew the who, the what, the when, the where. Only thing I gave was the intelligence. Like I said, I didn't know who was coming, what was coming, who was it going to be used on. All I did was give the intelligence. What kind of intelligence? Intelligence of when would be the best window of opportunity. At first, Nico came off as confident and denied everything. He tried to blame his cousins and even offered to wear a wire and go back to his neighborhood to collect evidence. But of course, the police declined this offer. His story eventually changed and took a strange turn, and he soon began speaking in tongues. And through all this gibberish, he blamed the Egyptian god, Apophis, for the killings. He said he would never hurt a woman unless he was directed by the serpent god and he claimed that the murders were ritual sacrifices. Towards the end of the confession, Nico sat on the floor with his head against the wall. He was confident that all of the blame would be put on the Nebraska Department of Corrections for releasing him in the first place. After he put everything on the table and confessed his crimes, he began crying. And Officer Pankonen can be seen consoling him. After eight long hours, the confession finally came to an end. And that's when they charged him with four counts of murder, four counts of a felon in possession, and four counts for use of a firearm. And they added these to the terroristic threat charges that he had had from before. So what will happen to Nico when he finally goes to trial? What will his punishment be? More on that right after our ad break. Today's episode of Lights Out is sponsored by Honey. We all shop online and we've all seen that promo code field that taunts us at checkout. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online and they range from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites and when you check out the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupons. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. With the holiday season right around the corner, many of us are doing our holiday shopping, including myself, all online. Rather than go into a physical store and maybe pay full price for something that you can actually get a discount on online, you can use Honey to help you with your holiday shopping to get all the gifts on your list, as well as save you a boatload of money. And I know for my Christmas shopping, I've probably saved hundreds of dollars on a wide range of different items from electronics to clothing to jewelry. I mean, Honey has truly been a lifesaver this holiday shopping season. So do what over 17 million members have done, and that's download Honey today. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lights out. That's joinhoney.com slash lights out. If you're looking for ways to skip the trip to the post office and dodge all that hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. As you've probably heard me say here on Lights Out, my company, Higher Love Wellness, we use stamps.com for all of our postage. And I got to say, it's saved us thousands and thousands of dollars and has helped us 
be more efficient and get more packages sent out because we don't have to go wait in line at the post office to buy postage and then send it. We can print all of our postage right in our warehouse and then schedule USPS to come right to our door and pick all of our packages up and get them out to all of our lovely customers. And even if you're not a business, stamps.com is great to use just for your personal uses, whether it's printing out postage for your holiday gifts to send to family, or it's just, you know, sending your rent money to your landlord. Stamps.com is the exclusive place to save up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. So why wait in line? You know, usually the line at the post office during the holiday season is out the door, just a waste of time. Do it all at home from the convenience of your computer and you can do it 24 seven so you're not beholden to the post office hours. So save time and money this holiday season with stamps.com. Sign up with this promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage and a digital scale. There's no long term commitments or contracts required. Just go to stamps.com. Then you click the little microphone at the top of the home page and enter code lights out to redeem this offer. And our last sponsor for today is every plate. The holiday season is the time to just eat, 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 and then eat some more. I mean, it's hard not to eat during the holiday season. And every plate makes it even easier to cook delicious and affordable home cooked meals, which are delivered right to your door for 50% cheaper than a meal made from grocery store ingredients, which is amazing. Saves you time and money. Recipes from every plate come together in about 30 minutes, which is definitely faster then driving all the way to the grocery store, getting all the ingredients, and then making a meal. Plus, there's way less food waste because they give you the exact amount of ingredients you need to make the exact amount of servings that that recipe calls for, which is really nice. You're not just throwing out and wasting money and food. That's just going to waste. You can choose between 17 recipes that change each week. You can swap proteins, veggies, and sides to your liking. As you guys know, we're also sponsored by HelloFresh, and actually every plate is a part of HelloFresh. They're owned by the same company. So the good thing about every plate versus HelloFresh is that the price point is much, much lower with every plate. In fact, you're getting meals starting at just $1.79 per meal. And you're not, you know, giving up the quality of ingredients or produce or anything like that. It's still just as delicious, but at a much more affordable price. I was truly impressed when I got my every plate box with the produce and level of ingredients they provided. It was honestly better than what I usually find at my local grocery store. So that's pretty cool. So what are you waiting for? Try every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code lights out 179. Get started with every plate for just $1.79 cheaper than a coffee by going to everyplate.com and entering code lights out 179. That's up to $104 value. So Nico, he's locked up in jail, awaiting his trial. Well, after only being in jail for two months, Nico wrote a letter to the Omaha World Herald in November. In it, he said he would plead guilty as long as he could get the psychiatric help he needed. He promised to protect Apophis' kingdom with animalistic savage brutality. He also claimed that the health department had full knowledge of Apophis' and the demonic forces at work, and they shouldn't have let him leave. After Nico's confession and his erratic behavior, Nebraska later reconsidered its supervised release program that allowed Nico to walk free in the first place. Two bills were introduced that would require more supervision for former inmates and create programs to help them transition back into society. Before trial, a judge ordered a psychiatric evaluation of Nico in order to see if he was competent enough to stand trial. Clearly, he was unstable, but they needed to know if he could actually stand trial. The doctor said he had an antisocial personality disorder and was most likely faking his other psychotic symptoms. They claimed he was making up this apophis voice in his head to justify his actions. Nico constantly talked about his mental illness, but always refused to take any medication for it. During the evaluations, he talked about himself as a brilliant mastermind and bragged, about himself constantly. Interview after interview, doctors thought he was a sociopath that wouldn't benefit from treatment. So after dozens of evaluations at Lincoln Correctional Center and a 31-page report, doctors concluded that he was manipulative, deceitful, and dangerous. And after taking an IQ test, he only scored 68, which is extremely low. 
By February 2014, Nico filed a lawsuit against the state of Nebraska seeking $24.5 million in damages. He argued that they released him from prison way too early and never gave him the mental treatment he needed. He told the doctors he needed mental help since the second grade and said that Apophis told him to bring the gun to school. He also said that Apophis saved him from committing suicide when he was in prison years before. And as long as he listened to this Egyptian god, the serpent would protect him. In the past few years, two doctors had diagnosed Nico with schizophrenia, but three other psychiatrists said that he was faking mental illness in order to escape punishment. He formed a narrative that the system failed him, and he was never given the help that he needed. The day after he filed the lawsuit, Judge Peter Batalin declared Nico competent to stand trial. He said it wasn't a matter of if he was insane or not. It depended on if he could understand what's going on in the prosecution against him. The judge had talked to Nico during the competency hearings, and Nico argued that a few constitutional rights were being violated since he was arrested. The fact that Nico understood what constitutional rights were told the judge that Nico understood perfectly what was going on. And he was also caught on a phone call from jail talking to a girlfriend about how he was prepared for the hearings. As long as Nico understood his rights, understood the court proceedings, and actively participated in his defense, he was fit for trial. Nico wanted to represent himself during the trial and didn't want an attorney, so they allowed it but only under the guidance of advisory attorneys. And throughout the proceedings, his main defense was that he was under the command of apophies. He even spoke in tongues and howled from his seat. While prosecutors talked about the specific details of his victim's deaths, Nico would just laugh out loud. They accused Nico of killing his victims to cover up the robberies and the carjacking. But Nico said he didn't remember killing anyone. He stuck to the story that he heard the voice of apophies in his head, and that he needed to make four human sacrifices. Dr. Eugene Olavito, one of the psychiatrists that examined Nico, said that he was a psychopath and one of the most dangerous people he'd ever met. They also brought in the psychiatrist who evaluated him when he was just eight years old, Dr. Jane Dolkey. She told the court that Nico had heard voices as a child and also saw black spirits. He also had reoccurring nightmares of his father shooting his mother. And one of the biggest questions throughout the trial was, is Nico Jenkins truly mentally ill? The rest of the trial focused on the evidence and the eyewitness testimonies. They brought several witnesses to the stand who testified against Nico, including Sherry Floyd, who told the story of how Nico first got the shotgun at the prison release party and how he threatened her life and her family. Nico's sisters, Melanie Jenkins and Erica Jenkins, also testified against Nico. Erica was pregnant while on the stand, and she talked about what had happened during the murder of Curtis Bradford and how he shot him. As the evidence added up, the prosecutors described the murders in detail, and Nico's only reaction was a few laughs. Although he had previously confessed on video, Anne wrote a letter to Douglas District Court on April 11th saying that he was going to plead guilty. Nico ended up pleading no contest. This means that he acknowledged that there was enough evidence to convict him but he wasn't going to admit that he was guilty of the crimes. He argued that his constitutional rights were being violated and that he couldn't get a fair trial. He also said that he didn't want his family members to be implicated in the murders, even though they testified against him. On April 16, 2014, Judge Peter Batalin found Nico guilty of all four murders. Prosecutors wanted the death penalty for Nico, but since he had waived his right to a trial by jury, a panel of three judges would end up deciding his fate. In the meantime, he waited in his jail cell. And while he waited for his sentencing, he made several body modifications over several months. Over a dozen incidents were reported when he was behind bars, as he constantly injured himself and cut his own face. Then he would smear his own blood on the cell walls, and he loved to get a reaction from the other inmates who would scream for help. But they eventually got used to his behavior, and one time they didn't call for help. As Nico bled out, he started to panic. He usually relied on other people screaming for help, but he realized he had to do it himself for once. So he finally screamed out for help. In 2015, he carved the number 666 into his forehead, but he accidentally did it backwards because he was looking into a mirror when he cut himself. He carved the word Satan into his face beside the other illegible tattoos. 
and he even sliced open the end of his tongue to make it look like a serpent's. Occasionally, he would drink his own urine and snort his own semen in front of the other inmates. He also tried to hang himself twice and swallowed a guard's set of keys. But the most horrific thing Nico did in jail was that he took a razor blade to his genitals. He actually sliced up his penis and tried to make it look like the ancient Egyptian serpent god, Apophis, which after this he ended up needing 27 stitches. After all of this, prosecutors claimed that he had told fellow prison employees that he had only mutilated himself so he could plead insanity. But when it came to the three-judge panel to determine if he would be sentenced to death, they weren't worried about his sanity. They were more worried about his IQ. Since his IQ was only 68, that put him extremely low on the IQ scale. And according to the Supreme Court case of Atkins v. Virginia in 2002, states couldn't execute a mentally disabled person. But Judge Peter Batalin ordered for the hearing to move forward and that Nico was competent. Before the death penalty hearing, Nico said he was set up and he wanted to expose the corruption within the system. In May 2017, after a three-year delay for multiple psych evaluations, the three-judge panel finally came to a conclusion. They ended up sentencing Nico to death for each of the four murders and an additional 450 years in prison. Here's a clip of his sentencing. The defendant's commission of these four murders over a 10-day period is one of the worst killing sprees in the history of this state. Each one of these murders was a deliberate and planned act. The victims were pre-selected and the murders were purposeful. Therefore, this panel finds that the death penalty is appropriate, should be, and is hereby given for each of the four murders by the defendant. Curtis Bradford's mother had attended all of the hearings and trials since the death of her son, and she cried tears of relief after the sentencing. This was the first death sentence to be given out after Nebraska had voted to bring it back in November the previous year. In the final stretch of sentencing, one of the judges said that this had been one of the worst killing sprees in the history of Nebraska, and after Nico sentencing, the rest of his family were also sentenced. Nico's mother, Lori, got 10 years for giving Nico the ammunition, and they later added five more years to her sentence, but she's now eligible for release in 2028. Christine Bordeaux, the friend that acted like a prostitute to lure the first two victims, was sentenced to 20 years in prison for robbery. After her initial arrest, she told the police everything and played a big role in convicting Nico and the rest of his family. His sister Erica got life in prison for the murder of Curtis Bradford. She also got 80 years on weapons charges and for beating Christine Bordeaux with a padlock in a sock at Nebraska Center for Women. She gave her welts all over her body a concussion and a broken nose and finger. She had previously lost an appeal for an assault conviction, and in 2021, she changed her name to Illuminati a goddess in Nico Prestige. Christine later sued Nebraska prison officials in 2018, claiming they didn't protect her from Erica. Nico's cousin, Anthony Wells, who was accused of providing the shotgun, was found not guilty by a judge. And Nico's uncle, Warren Levering, was the last to be sentenced and he pleaded no contest in the murder of Andrea Kruger and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Shalanda Jenkins, Nico's wife, was convicted in 2013 for being an accomplice in an unrelated shooting and convicted again in 2015 for an unrelated weapons charge. Supposedly, she gave birth to another man's child while her and Nico were married, and they later divorced in 2017. But during their marriage, they had only spent a total of four weeks together outside of the prison walls. And after all of the convictions, most of the family was behind bars, but the nightmare wasn't over. From a handful of reevaluations after his sentencing, some psychiatrists agree that Nico suffers from schizophrenia, but when they prescribed him medication, he always refused to take it. Dr. Bruce Gutnecht thought he wasn't competent to stand trial. As far back as 2011, Dr. Gutnecht had diagnosed Nico with schizophrenia. In 2013, he examined Nico again and claimed that he had several mental illnesses, including schizophrenia, or schizoactive disorder, depression, and a personality disorder. And over the next several years, Dr. Gutnick kept evaluating him, and his conclusion was always that Nico was psychotic. His main argument was that no one in their right mind would mutilate their own genitals, even if they were trying to fake a mental illness. Nico didn't do well while he waited for his execution. In 2018, he attempted suicide in prison by slashing his own throat, but survived. 
The same year, they began forcibly medicating Nico, and he improved for a bit, but it didn't last for long. Again, in 2019, he pulled a tile from one of the prison walls, sharpened it, and stabbed himself in the eyes and the neck multiple times. His attorneys say that by now, his number of suicide attempts are in the double digits. His attorney also argued that it's wrong to forcibly medicate a prisoner so that they can keep him on death row. Nico believed he'd soon be set free and moved to Cuba one day where he can make nuclear weapons under the direction of Apophis. He also believed he needed to be killed so that he could be resurrected. During his time on death row, he met a 46-year-old woman named Don Arguello in 2019. Don was a volunteer for a nonprofit inmate advocacy group where she met Nico and fell in love with him. She said he's often misunderstood and is actually a sensitive guy. Nico also tattooed Don's name on his face as a sign of affection, but she didn't like that. They currently plan to get married even though Nico is still on death row. And later in 2019, the court rejected the notion that he had any mental illness. And they agreed that Nico acted out of the ordinary, but according to a test, the score showed that he was faking a mental disorder. On April 20th, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear Nico's appeal. Although Nico still sits on death row at Tecumseh State Prison, the Omaha World Herald reported that Nebraska's supply of lethal injections expired in 2018, and they haven't restocked since then. To this day, the attorneys and doctors still argue whether or not Nico is truly mentally ill or not, and he is still seen as one of Nebraska's most terrifying killers. But whether he was guided by psychotic thoughts or faking his insane behavior, is still hotly debated. So that leads us to what do we think? Do we think that Nico is truly mentally ill? In my opinion, I think Nico is mentally ill, but also that he was a very good manipulator. And I think he had that self-awareness about, you know, mental issues that he was fighting on a constant day-to-day basis. But what stuck out to me is if if he knew he was having some mental issues, then why wouldn't he want to help himself and take that medication? I mean, it could have been a part of his crazy ideologies that he followed to not take that medication. But it seems like he just kind of used that as his crutch of why he why he did the things he did, like something to blame everything for. Sure. And yeah. I think a reason for the self-harm and what he did to his face was to, you know, I think he understood that he was going to be either put to death or he's going to be in prison for a long time. So in his defense, he wanted to make himself look as fucked up as possible, which I think he accomplished. Um, And, you know, just to show to the court, try and get them to buy his whole story of like, he is truly mentally ill. He's not fit to stand trial. Yeah. You know, it's it's just hard for me to think like this person would put himself through all that pain without yeah. without a motive of sure. like why he's doing it. Cause, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think it's a really tough one because it's such a multi-layered issue. And I think you could say just from the mere fact of his childhood and who he grew up with, who his parents were, that the the you know the things that he experienced i mean for you know he got ptsd i mean there's a lot of other things that i think aren't aren't even diagnosed that play into his mental well-being and i think that that alone just tells you that you know from a young age of seven years old i mean to be exposed to that and grow up in that environment i mean it's going to mold you and shape you and i mean who knows what drugs that the guy used who knows what other substances that have sort of, I mean, there's substances out there that will completely like change your entire mind, mind state will rewire your brain and, yeah. and make you mentally ill. So it's like, I think, I think I'm fairly certain in, in my opinion that he is mentally ill. I think, I think, yeah, sure. He's probably trying to make it seem way crazier than he is because he, he's probably, he's just like, that's a lot of people think that if you go on trial and you you know you claim to be insane that it's going to end up you're going to end up in a better place as a result of it right you're not gonna you know you likely won't see death row necessarily and you'll spend the rest of your life in prison 
uh, you know, without parole, or you'll be in some sort of mental institution. And yeah. sometimes people think that that's a better route right. than just, you know, going to death row where, you know, who knows when you'll be executed. So I think, I think from that standpoint, I think definitely mentally ill. I mean, the point of where you're mutilating yourself, you're committing suicide that many times. That means that takes, I mean, I don't think a sane person could do that. Yeah. Or mutilate your genitals, like oh right. my god, like. But then again, was he getting drugs in prison? That was yeah. We don't. I don't it, know. It's just tough to know because if he was getting like opiates, for an example, then I mean his dick would have been numb before he he started get chopping. His that, whole body so. could have been numb. Well, probably know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, like uh, I mean, who knows? Like what what the real? I'm I'm sure there's a lot more to his evaluations interesting though mm-hmm. that the court continued to find him not mentally ill but it seemed to be based off of of things that like your iq like we all know that iq scores are not what it, you know not something that's really taken all that seriously anymore because right. it's like very that's an old school way yeah. of measuring somebody's intelligence i don't know that much about it but i just know that it's not like like if they went based on that then that just seems stupid to me. Oh, I mean, yeah. there's a lot more to, to factor in here and it could just be, you know, sometimes there's just bad doctors in these working for the corrections facilities or right. there's countless reasons for why he could have been ruled competent to stand trial and things. I think the guy was clearly mentally ill. I think he was pro you know, he's schizophrenic. I mean, it's clear that he's hearing voices. He's talking to, he's talking about demonic forces. Yeah. He's, believes he's he's this egyptian god and he's like being commanded by it and it's like you know it's it's one of those things it's tough though because it's also like you know james holmes is the same kind of and he was you know you know he's considered mentally in, insane mm-hmm. you know in the end and so it's like are they in the you know people argued that he was faking it and that he was the smart guy that you know can't possibly be mentally ill so i mean without being an expert in mental health, I think it's really hard to say either way, but I mean, from observing and and reading about this guy, I just think that, I mean, he's clearly got some, some type of mental illness going on. And I think Nico, you know, was a product of his upbringing too, and his family. And, you know, that all played into it as well. Um, So I think, you know, I think it's a multi-layered issue. You know, it's not, this is a very complex case of of somebody's mental health and, you know, without actually, you know, being a mental health professional and, and meeting this guy, I think it's impossible to say, you know, what his mental state was, right. but from the outside, it sure looks like he was mentally ill, but I think it's absolutely crazy though, that they let this guy out of, out of prison, like earlier. And they literally right after he went and committed these murders, like you just let a felon out of prison and it seemed like they had no idea what he was up to or where he was going. And he, right away got a weapon and decided to use it so i think there was definitely a definitely fault here in just the state of nebraska and yeah well it was the specifically the parole board that nico went up against before being let out of prison because they're the i guess it's only a few people from what i know but they could have mis evaluated his whole situation or you know nico's just such a great manipulator that he just went up in that meeting and just told them what they wanted to hear and could be they got them out yeah so. could could be i mean uh, it's just like it's it's i think it's one of those really tragic cases where the system that is in place to protect society from people like nico absolutely failed the Definitely. community and i mean these poor people were you know were gunned down mm-hmm. For virtually no reason other than Nico was just, you know, out there being crazy and just, you know, had no regard for anything because that's all he's known his entire life is violence and and incarceration. And he was just he probably just figured, like, I'm going to end up back in jail anyway. So, like, what's the point? I'm going to come out here and do what I think I need to do based Mm -hmm. on, you know, what what this Egyptian God is telling me to do. So it's like. Or what these voices are telling him to do. So I think it was a, I mean, I think the state of Nebraska is has a you know blood on their hands for letting this guy out without keeping an eye on him or put him on house arrest or you know have some sort of way to track him so that they know exactly where he's going, and you know can make sure he's not talking to the people that are going to connect him 
with right alcohol drugs weapons and you know give him the opportunity to commit another violent act i mean it's no no surprise that he did this i mean his history just shows i mean from a young age he was assaulting people violence and it's just like i i can't imagine that the courts were surprised when they saw this guy back there for for murders and Mm -hmm. it's like if i were the you know the husband of andrea you know and like this was a mother who was gunned down because Nico liked her SUV and wanted to take it for a joyride. It's like, this was totally preventable. Yeah. You know, in yeah. my opinion, I think it was totally preventable that he should have been a not released at all, but B, if he was released, he should have been released in a different manner. And there right. should have been somebody watching every move they makes, you know, some type of monitoring going on. And the fact that he just like willy nilly got let out and, and right away he got back with his old his family members and they're immediately out there committing crimes again i mean it was like what did you expect Mm -hmm. like when you said yeah let nico out like he's gonna go right back and do it again right so i think this was a major failing of the nebraska correctional uh division of uh, you know of government or you know whoever looks over the prison system because yeah this this whole case should have never happened you should have never been capable or a you know enable to oh. murder four people so yeah it's it's a really tough one you know it's it's difficult because obviously mental illness is a huge huge thing and a huge issue and you know i i think they're you know one of his biggest arguments is like you know while incarcerated i received no rehabilitation there's no you know he was eventually they forced him to take meds and stuff but it's like you know there's got to be there's got to be a better way to to deal with with people who are criminals and violent that have severe mental illnesses that do need you know lots of help and therapy yeah because they're just not getting it and as we all know i mean with all the prison shows that are out now we all know what prison's really like now inside if you've never been to prison yourself i mean you know it it ain't a place of rehabilitation most prisons or jails don't offer any form of rehabilitation and people just become institutionalized where once they're scared to get out and go back into the real world because they don't have any skills to bring to the new world other right. than what they learned behind bars. Because while you're in prison, you are, you're forced to adjust to prison life. Yeah. And yeah, prison adapt. life is like savage animal right. world. It's like everybody, they feel like animals, they're treated like animals. So it becomes this like animalistic society you join that operates extremely different from the outside yeah. normal society so it's like how do you expect somebody to go especially who's already violent already has this history already mentally ill to go into prison spend time in prison where that behavior is just emphasized in like right. in, you know worse. instigated yeah. on a day-to-day basis where you got to be the baddest most savage person in there you want people to be scared and screaming for help for you Mm -hmm. because that's like how you survive in prison you got to be that scary person and hence why a lot of people get prison tattoos and you know tattoo their face or self-mutilate themselves so that they look intimidating scary and intimidating because otherwise you get eaten alive in there so it's like it's just it's a huge huge problem and and i and i wish there was some way to to fix it because i think if you look at other countries in other parts of the world and in Europe and Norway, and and you look at the way their prisons are set up and I mean, they have violent people that commit rapes and murders and things like that. But the way they, they actually rehabilitate them is actually helping versus hurting them even further. And obviously it's totally different because we're talking about a huge population of people. So it's like, how, how, what's the logistics behind it? I, I don't have the answer to that, but as far as like, this idea that prison you know you go to jail or prison and you turn your life around and yeah there are stories that people you know there are a fair number of people that go in prison they get off drugs or they find religion or like they somehow like turn their life around and and make it out back into society in the Mm -hmm. real world but the the realities is like the majority of, of inmates that are released from prison go right back right because they're not rehabilitated they just all they know is how to be a criminal in jail and prison just encourages that be a criminal and there's drugs and there's weapons and there's violence and there's and just there's (laughs) the worst of the worst happening in there so it's like you know how do you how do you even release somebody back into you know the society like nico without 
even thinking that something terrible might happen. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that's exactly what happened and they totally messed up on this one and four people died as a result that shouldn't have is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a big wake up call. I'm sure it was a big wake up call to the, you know, Nebraska Department of Correction because they're like, oh, I bet, you know, and they made changes because of Mm -hmm. because of Nico's case. So it's it's one of those it's one of those cases that really kind of opens your eyes to the reality of the criminal justice system and just shows you how broken it is how how many things are just lacking and resources are lacking i mean some jails like you can't even get your medications there no like you might come in and you need medications for this or that but they don't even give it to you it's like what like like people that need it to survive like Mm -hmm. you're lucky to even get the medical help you need in in prison it's just it's crazy it's it is it's one of those that i could go on and on for for hours talking about the the prison system and criminal justice system because i think it is truly i think it's supremely outdated oh, i yeah. think it's antiquated i think all of it is just so it it needs to be revamped from the ground up and mm-hmm. you know unfortunately it's it seems like that's not going to happen anytime soon no. and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse before it gets better so yeah, let us know what your guys' thoughts are on Nico Jenkins. Though it's a, it's a very interesting case. You know, what are your thoughts? Do you think he's mentally ill? Do you think it was? You know, you think they let him out too early? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you're following us on social media as well at Lights Out Cast on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. And also, we are now on TikTok, which is cool. So if you're on TikTok, you can search Lights Out Podcast, or we our handle is at Lights Out Cast there as well, where we'll be posting. Uh, a lot of different clips uh, from the episodes and maybe some other just more candid stuff of me and Joel eventually. But yeah, check us out on TikTok. But that is it for us today. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Lights Out podcast. And until next time, lights out, everybody.